We have uh, been discussing uh, the Trinity. It uh, was at the request of one in the congregation that uh, we provide this uh, so that uh, they can have a, a copy in hand to hand to some of their uh, friends uh, with regard to the, the Trinity to just, just show what we believe. Of course, um, probably they already know it and have dismissed it uh, in favor of what is called uh, Sibelian modalism that we've talked about before. But uh, that's not the, the only uh, aberration, uh, the difference. There are others who believe in three gods uh, uh, and so forth. There are others who believe that only God the Father was a God and that Christ is a secondary God and so forth. That's called Arianism and uh, the other is called Tritheism and so forth. Uh, but we here uh, believe in the Trinity. There is a triunity and a uniplurality in the one God. Uh, and that is the only conclusion that you can come up with, that uh, there indeed is this Trinity. Now we work through the passages, uh, and there, there are perhaps many others. This is just a brief outline, but there are many others that talk about His oneness, His singularity, uh, His uniqueness, and the fact that there is none other, none like Him, and so forth. But we've moved on then to the uh, plurality of God, and we showed how that even though there are three distinct individual persons within this one God essence, uh, that it remains undivided. Uh, there are no problems there, simply because there is a unity of purpose and thought. This solidarity of purpose ensures their union of being. They have always lived together in this fashion. They will always live together in this fashion. But now we're going to move into uh, our, uh, the second part of our outline here in talking about the plurality of God. Just as there were several points that uh, showed us that God is one, there are several points that show us that God is many. Now, uh, one of the first ones here is uh, the fact that there are personalized titles or names for each of these individuals. Uh, it is quite depersonalizing to think that we are just naming a mask. One guy who is an actor wearing three masks. But when you realize that we are giving distinctive names to three different individuals, then uh, it becomes more personal and intimate. Uh, when we say God the Father, we don't have to wait for, the, for Him to take off the spirit mask and put on the Father mask. He already is the Father in and of Himself and doesn't have to change or alter anything. Now the Apostle Paul in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 gives us a grace age doctrinal statement. And starting with verse number 4, he gives us a trinity. Uh, it says there's one body. Now here, here, here is a uniplural concept. There's one body, only one. There's no other body of Christ in the sense of this age. But is there just one member? No. First Corinthians chapter 12 says there's one body, but many members. It's a uniplural concept. And it's the same thing with God. Uh, there's one spirit. When you're looking at the Godhead, you have to realize that there is one person called God the Holy Spirit. That is his designation. He has an office work. He has a ministry. He has something to do. He has a special relationship with the other two. But he himself is the Spirit. Uh, we're coming on down to verse number five. There is one Lord. That has to be with reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the only Savior. He is the only mediator. He is the only Redeemer. He's the only uniquely conceived or begotten Son of God. Uh, he is the special one, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the thing about this, when you get into the mask business, you have to ask yourself, well, then who died on the cross of Calvary? Was it the Father wearing the Son's mask? Well, then in actuality, the Son didn't die on Calvary, but who did? The Father did. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, that's blasphemy. You believe that? You're not saved. You have to specify and distinguish who's doing what in the Godhead with regard to our redemption. Verse we read under the, uh, the singularity concept. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is it? The Spirit? The Father? No, it's Jesus Christ. 
Who, who is he mediating for? God the Father and men, you see. So you, when you get to uh, uh, fouling up and, and corrupting these concepts, you get into real trouble. And so uh, in uh, the last here, verse number six, there is one God and Father of all. So uh, there's a spirit, there's uh, the Son, there is the Father, and they are all called God. For example, John chapter 6. In John chapter 6. Well, I just made a big leap forward and went to Job. Job would not do. John will. John 6, 27. Actually, we have a distinction here between the uh, two members of the Godhead and a uh, it says here, labor not for the meat that perishes, but for the meat which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man, here's, here's God, Jesus in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ, in the person of His Son, shall give to you. For Him, there's one individual, hath God the Father sealed. That's another individual. The Father didn't seal Himself, the Father sealed the Son. And in order for that to happen, there has to be two different persons. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. We've been here many, many times. I hate to take you here again, but it's just uh, one of the best of all the uh, Trinitarian um, proof texts, passages. Verse number 5. To which of the angels said he at any time? Now the he is a reference to the Father. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So I'll be to him a father, and he'll be to me a son. But uh, this, is, this is God the, the Father speaking. While we're here, note what uh, the designation that the Father gives to the Son. Verse 8, to the Son he says, the Father is speaking. There's a conversation, as we'll see in just a little bit. There's another proof text. Can you imagine the, and it is sheer idiocy of the concept of, of, the, of one God wearing a mask and, and talking to, here, here, put the mask on, it's the sun. Over here, you put the mask down, put the mask up here, and you hear the words, then you speak back. Put the mask down, and, then, and it's just a, going back and forth with this old mask business. It is nonsense. It, uh, it is um, unreal. To the son, the father spoke, thy throne, O God. So here we have God the Father, and now we have God the, uh, the Son. Uh, therefore, verse number 9, God the Son, even thy God the Father, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness. So, Jesus Christ uh, is, has a special name. That's, uh, that's Christ. Um, but he also has a special designation or title. That's the Son. And they're two separate now, the way that we prove this, of course, is what we alluded to last hour in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And verse 1. The Word, of course, is Jesus Christ. And it says, the Word was with God. That demands two people. It cannot be one person wearing two masks simultaneously. It's an impossibility. It demands two people in the Godhead. And the word was God. It's the same word that was made flesh, and he's the only begotten of the Father. Two separate individuals. Verse 18. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now that phrase is a Middle Eastern um, concept where, where men, you know, over there, those guys are always hugging one another, they're always bowing down to one another, they're always kissing one another. And um, it also, in the bosom of, meant that you were bosom buddies, uh, that you were held uh, dear. Uh, if you were sitting at a banquet table, your best friend or honored guest would sit next to you, and that was called being in your bosom, sitting near for close uh, fellowship. Uh, and that's what this means. But 
It always demands more than one person involved. The concepts would be meaningless if the father sat here and then he was over here and he was a guy in the bosom and then he was a guy embracing and so forth. That, I mean, think of it. It'd be those cartoons going back and forth trying to, trying to get this thing all done. Uh, and it just, it just simply cannot be. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 8. So we've seen Paul's doctrinal statement, and then secondly, there are specific verses identifying these uh, three individuals by giving them titles or names, and identifying each one of them as God. Doesn't say that they're gods, it says each one of them is God, and the reason being, they, only, they all three share one existence. All right, chapter eight in Romans. Verse 13, here's the Spirit. If ye through the Spirit mortify the many of us are led by the Spirit of God. Doesn't say by God the Son, by God the Father, by the Spirit of God. We have received the Spirit of adoption. That's because He comes in and He is the seal of our salvation, uh, the down payment of promise. The Spirit itself, literally the Spirit Himself, bears witness with our spirit that we're the, the children of God. It's not the Father that does it. It's not the Son that does it. That's the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. So His Spirit comes within. It, uh, he indwells us. And we have a human spirit. And guess who is the main person telling us we're born again? The one who did it, God, the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, not 1st. Verse 3, you're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, but written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but fleshly tables of the heart. So, when you come to the Word of God, the Father has a ministry. He's got a unique title. Uh, he's got a, a position. The Son has the same. The Spirit has the same. And the only way this could be is that there are three separate individuals uh, that hold these, um, these uh, titles and positions. First John, point number two. Now, here is a, a fantastic point of doctrine proving the Trinity. We'll not turn there, but I have it listed. There are others that talk about, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Okay, now, was that one witness with three masks, or was, was it three separate people? Well, it's obvious it's three separate people. That'd be a good one. Well, officer, wait. <laughs> this testifies that this, you know, I've got three witnesses here. Well, so it's the same person. Uh, just play acting, different, assuming a different identity. It's nonsense. If you're going to have witnesses, especially with regard to a capital offense and uh, the death penalty, you have to have at least two or three separate ones before that person can be put to death. And so, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word of testimony be established. So here we come with verse number seven. There are three that bear record in heaven. Now, to fulfill the command of the Mosaic law, the strict requirement of two or three witnesses, can it possibly be one God with three masks bearing record in heaven? It cannot be that. It has to be three separate witnesses bearing record in heaven. And it names them who these witnesses are. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They're one God, but what's the one referring to? Their testimony, their record, they all agree. The three witnesses, yeah, I saw the guy bop the other guy on the head and it was an intentional act of murder. But witness two said, I saw the very same thing. Witness three, separate witnesses, yeah, I saw the very same thing. Uh, put your hands on him, chuck the rocks and get rid of this guy. 
But here's God the Father establishing that one testimony regarding uh, uh, Jesus Christ. They all say the same thing. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 1. Under point number three. Now Genesis 1. Just as there was specialized technical vocabulary proving the singularity of God, there is a technical vocabulary proving the plurality of God. Ekad is the first, Elohim is the second. And uh, this is, as we have mentioned, a uniplural form. Uh, El is the base word, meaning God, the strong God, the almighty God. But when you attach I am as a suffix on the end of it, you make it plural. So in actuality, it can be translated God, but it's a, a one God's or something of that nature. It's difficult to, to even translate the word because uh, it's always uh, translated God, but it always means more than one. And so when you come down here to verse number one in Genesis uh, chapter one, in the beginning, Elohim. Now, the important thing here is that this very first verse of Scripture with this technical word does not prove the Trinity, but it allows for the Trinity. Uh, you have to go elsewhere and, and find out what it's talking about. And we know that there are only three that the Bible specifies as God. But the very first word uh, that, uh, with reference to God is a plural word. In the beginning, the one gods, as you, I guess it's, it's very hard to, uh, to, to uh, translate it, or the one God in three persons created the heavens and the earth. Now, how did all three gods do it? Number one, they have consistent roles in creation. The Father is the planner, the Son is the creator, and the Spirit is the restorer. Plain and simple. The Son doesn't restore, the Spirit restores. The Father didn't do the creating, the Father did the planning, but the Son uh, did the creating. All things were made by Him. There wasn't anything made that was made that wasn't made by Jesus Christ. Okay, very uh, same thing down here in verse number 26. This is going to move us then to our third point. And God said... You, you recall us talking about an eternal life uh, convocation, an eternal life conference, uh, a meeting between the members of the Godhead. And uh, that's uh, this is where we get this. That uh, before the foundation of the, uh, the universe, the three members got together and they voted. And all three raised their right hand and said, I, 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 I. Oh, no, it's bad when you read my mind. No, I'm good. I'm that predictable. Sorry. And Elohim said. Now, that means that the three, as we can now read back, knowing what we know, read back to this point. We know that there are three. But uh, even if we did not know that, we would know that there are at least two. Because the word Elohim demands Somebody else in the picture. It can't be just one person uh, saying uh, something. But it is a, it, the picture is a vote where God the Father says, this is what I think. Uh, and all together now say, I, and he raised his hand, the Son, the Spirit raised his hand. And so it says, and God, the, 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 the plurality said something. Now this moves us into our uh, point three here. This is the only way these verses can make sense, to understand it, that there's more than one person. And God said, let us. Now, anybody reading, and God, singular, without knowing that this word is Elohim, wait a minute, this doesn't match. Because the noun and the verb have to match in what? Per, in intense, yeah, in person, and number, gender, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so, uh, uh, this done, what do you mean, us? God said, there's not more than one. Oh, yes, there is. Im 
means there has to be more than one. And therefore you have a plural pronoun. Let us make man in our image. Uh, so uh, um, you, you, you read these things and now you begin to understand that it, way back in the Old Testament from the very start, the potential for more than one person in the Godhead was there in the vocabulary. And it moves from the uh, from just simply the uh, the word here to uh, the um, the plural pronouns used for God. All right, let's go to chapter three, verse twenty-two. And the Lord God said, Jehovah Elohim said, Behold, now. This, this particular combination of the, uh, the two words indicates that one of the three is speaking. Lord Jehovah Elohim, one of the three, said, Behold the man, he's talking to the other two, is become as one of me? <laughs> no, as one of us, to know good and evil. Uh, and then it uh, goes on uh, to... to um, Talk about what they're going to do. Turn to chapter 11. So you have Jehovah Elohim, one of the three speaking, or one of the more than one speaking. Here you have uh, verse number five. The Lord came down. Jehovah came down. Uh, uh, they're, they're sending a scout out. <laughs> This is probably God the Son, I would gather. Came down to see the city and the tower. The Lord said, coming back up to the others, giving a report. The people is one, they've all one language. Nothing is restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Verse 7. Go to, let us go down. Now, it's not one God gathering the three masks and going down there so he can uh, keep putting up these masks here. It is, it is the Lord coming down, uh, uh, seeing the, the sights, doing a little reconnaissance, going back up, giving his report, and saying, this is what we need to do. Let's us go down there. All right, one more. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And verse number eight. Where it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And then it says, Who will go for us? You see, there's, there's more than one that he is addressing. And they all have to be God, because we're going to see in just a little bit um, what, what are called uh, 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 tri-singular parallels. And uh, while we're here, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, to save a little time, maybe we'll just do that. Another one of the points has to do with uh, there are tri-singular parallels in the Scripture. Um, uh, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. Uh, the Lord, uh, uh, how, how does that uh, benediction go? Uh, and, give, and give thee peace, you know, and so forth. Well, how many times was the word Lord used there? Three. It's a tri-singular parallel. And it's addressing all three persons of, of, of the Godhead. Just like right here. Uh, he saw the Lord, verse number one, sitting upon the throne, but then he, they cried one to another, these angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Uh, and it's, um, it's addressing all three persons of the Trinity. Now we drop down to verse number eight, and one stands up and says, who will go for, uh, uh, whom shall I send? And then who will go for us? The, the other two signified by this uh, tri-singular parallel here. Holy, holy, holy. All right, let's move on down. We're in point five. Back to Genesis chapter 18. We'll try to uh, uh, quickly go through uh, these uh, these things so we can put it all on one tape 
We can skim through some of these verses here. Verse number one, And the Lord appeared to Abraham, the plains of Mamre. And you know the story, how he talked to him. And um, verse number 16, The men, which were actually angels, appearing as men, looked toward Sodom. Uh, verse 16, Abraham went with them, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? He was going to destroy Sodom. Uh, and he said, verse number 20, Because the cry of Sodom is great, I will go down and see whether they have done all together. This was, we remember down in, in uh, chapter 11, the Lord came down. Well, in this particular case, the Lord came down again. It's obviously Jesus Christ. The men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham talked with the Lord there. All right, then they, the Lord went his way, says verse number 33. He was going over to Sodom. Now the reason that he was, chapter 19, note verse 13. And we're, we've moved into point number five. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, that's the Father in heaven, and the, uh, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. That's the Lord on earth, that he came down and he told Abraham what, what he was going to do. And he sent the angels and he left Abraham and he went over there to inspect it. And sure enough, it was as he said. Now, how do we know this? Can we prove this? Yes. Verse 24. Then the Lord... Jesus Christ down on earth who inspected the situation rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. Oh, wait one second. That has to be two people. One came down from the presence of the Father. One inspected it said to the Father, hey, it's deserving. And the Father sent down fire. Two lords, two different places, two different people, heaven and earth, and fire came down. Now, uh, Psalms 110. Psalms 110. The Lord on earth, Jesus Christ, who came down, told the angels, to go ahead and rain the fire, and fire came from the Lord that was in heaven. And so 110 here in the book of Psalms, verse 1. How can we explain this? Well, the Lord, God the Father, said unto my Lord, David's Lord is ours as well, Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord on the, uh, the, the Lord two on the Lord one's right hand went down to see Sodom, said it's worthy. The Lord one sent the fire down on Sodom out of heaven. All right. Uh, and so what we're doing here is doing the very same thing we did under the first point with singularity, the use of spatial and comparative orientations. What's, what's the space here? Heaven and earth. And two lords are in existence simultaneously in these two places. Uh, what's, the, what's the spatial and comparative? One throne and another at the right hand. One lord occupying that throne, another lord simultaneously sitting at the right hand of this lord. There are two separate people. It would not make sense uh, otherwise. All right, let's, let, let's just quote this one. It's, it's a... It's a under point five, we have a, a third, the reference of the Father being in heaven while Christ is, uh, is on earth. He said to the disciples, I go to my what? My Father. Where, where was the Father? In heaven. Where was He? On earth. He said, pray this way, our Father which art in heaven. Uh, you know, he, he was on earth. Obviously, the presence of the Father was in heaven uh, on that throne. And then uh, uh, John chapter 14, John chapter 14, and verse number 28, John 14, 28, which says, you have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again to you. If you loved me, you'd rejoice because I go to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. Now, now obviously, he knows who he is, what his powers are, where he fits in the hierarchy as a distinct individual and person. 
and he knows who his father is and his father is greater. When it says, I and my father are one, that means they're of the same mind together. When he says, I and my father are greater, it means that these uh, two people are in a power, uh, a chain of command, where the father is over the son. All right, let's go back to Isaiah 14. Might, might have to save some of these for uh, tonight, I don't know. We're, we're about to run out of time here. We still have a ways to go. Isaiah chapter 48. Now, a convocation in theological terms is where a group gathers, more than one gathers to a place. And in the Bible, we have convocations of the Godhead. Uh, and what we're going to do now is show you some of the um, uh, revealed ones. Uh, some are not um, uh, as obvious as others, just like the Elohim, let us do this and us do that. But now here we actually have them delineated. Isaiah 48, 16. Come ye near to me, hear ye this. This is Jesus Christ doing the talking. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I. Now the Lord God, the Father, and his Spirit has sent me. So, uh, we've got a convocation here. And the Father said, okay, it's time. And the Holy Spirit says, I concur. We both lay our hands on you, and here's your ministry, you go. But now, the interesting thing is this. Come, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. We'll investigate these verses, then our time is just about up. We'll save, save the rest for tonight, but I don't think we'll record it for, for those that um, want. They can just look at the um, study guide here. John chapter 14. And uh, verse number 16. Now, one of the convocations, God the... Father and the Spirit got together with God the Son and sent him. Now the Son is on earth and he's telling these guys, uh, the apostles, I'm going to go back to my Father. When he goes back to his Father, there's going to be another convocation of the three. All three will be together at Command Central in the throne room. And we're going to have another commissioning of a separate person of the Godhead. When he goes to the Father, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he might abide with you forever. Note, it's not me, it's he. I'm going to the Father. A separate person is going to come down here and, and uh, be your comforter. Now, it's the word paraclete, which means an alongside one, an enabler, a counselor, and, and so forth. And this is in keeping with Israel's covenant of endowment. And then he designates him. Even the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive doesn't see him, but you'll know him, for he's going to dwell with you. Chapter 15, verse 26. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So he goes back up, all three of them are together, and just as the Father and Spirit originally sent the Son, now the Father and the Son are sending the Spirit back down to earth. He came on the day of Pentecost. And let's go to chapter 2, verse 33. Acts chapter 2, verse number 33. Now, did I just hear somebody say, well, yeah, yeah. See, 
it's it's harder to speak to a small crowd, but it's easier to hear. <laughs> you, yeah, can all no longer make those snide remarks. They only get bits and pieces of. It. And the crowd is bigger. Verse thirty-three. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, reference to the day of Pentecost, which ye now see and hear. David's not ascended to the heavens, but the Lord. Christ ascended and sat down on the right hand of the Father on high, the majesty on high. So uh, there you have the two convocations where commissioning was done. The only way it can make sense, as we have insisted time and again with this Trinitarian business, the only way these verses can ever make sense is that there's at least more than one, but we know that there are only three given to us in the Scripture. And so there is not more than one God, but there's more than one person in the Godhead, and uh, we find that the Bible delineates three, so we must make this conclusion. Add this fact up with this fact, there is one God in three persons, or a trinity. Uh, and it can't be anything else. And, and these convocations show us. Father, uh, the Father and the Spirit sent the Son. The Son went back up to the Father. All three were together. The Father and the Son sent the Spirit. Uh, and, uh, and it just only makes sense if you're a Trinitarian.